Donc, euh, bienvenue, bienvenue à cette conférence euh, de l'année arctique 2020. Uh, hi, and welcome to this conference on the Arctic region in 2020. Um, great to, for you to be here. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll start in a few, uh, a few minutes. Um, simplement, avant de commencer, uh, présenter un, un peu les, les, organ les organismes qui sont derrière cette conférence. Euh, donc, évidemment, la conférence est organisée par le Centre d'études en politique internationale de l'Université d'Ottawa, euh, l'Observatoire de la politique et de la sécurité de l'Arctique, l'OPSA, que je dirige, moi, Mathieu Andrio, et euh, le réseau sur la défense et la sécurité euh, de l'Arctique, euh, RD, euh, RDS. Euh, euh, donc, merci d'être parmi nous. Un petit remerciement avant de commencer, évidemment, pour euh, remercier euh, les appuis euh, à l'OPSA qui ont aidé à, à réaliser cette conférence en, en plus de ces, de ces, euh, ces organisations. Euh, L'OPSA voudrait remercier le ministère des Relations internationales et de la francophonie du Québec pour son appui euh, à ses activités en général, dont cette conférence. Um, Before, uh, uh, before we start, just a few, a few words on format, on the structure of this conference as well. Uh, it will be a bilingual conference. We're in Ottawa, so bilingual, uh, English, French. Uh, we'll, um, uh, the first, so the first panel will be in English. Um, the second panel will be in French. We'll take each, uh, pres uh, each uh, speaker will have 15 minutes uh, to present uh, their observations. And uh, we'll have a 10, 15 minutes before panel one and panel two, just to give us a bit of time to restructure. Uh, we have a time for a Q&A session. So if you have questions as a, as a speaker, present their observations, uh, you can go at the bottom of the screen. There's a Q&A option. And you can just click on that button there to um, uh, type your question. Um, question Bowden. French and English, um, I can do. I can do the translation. Many of our speakers are bilingual as well. Um, a bit to present the uh, the rationale behind this initiative is the second year that OPSA and, and uh, RESNA do this uh, this annual review. So the uh, the rationale behind the review was to focus on salient developments. So salient developments that happen in the Arctic region in a given year on different fronts, on different dimensions, whether you'll see today some connectivity, shipping, uh, North American defense, military operations, uh, human security, diplomacy, uh, natural resources. So to look at um, all of these dimensions and how they evolved in the past, in the past year. Of course, as we know, this year has been an exceptional year <laughs> uh, with COVID-19. Pretty much impacting everything and impacting almost the entire year. Um, also, for our purpose on, on the Arctic region, uh, climate change um, um, has really left a deep impact on the region, and we saw an acceleration of this other crisis that uh, often um, has been uh, often put to the margin uh, by the COVID 19 uh, crisis and its consequences on people. So we'll keep that in mind as we progress. We'll hear a lot about climate change, I think, and the impact of that on different sectors, on different aspects of, of Arctic life, also about COVID-19, of course. Um, but without further ado, I want to give time to our experts um, to present their observations on, 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 on their topic. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'll turn to our experts. Um, The first topic that we want to cover is uh, shipping, and I'll, I'll leave the, uh, the virtual podium to Frédéric Lassa. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Matthew. So uh, uh, I have the honor to begin the, 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 the conference and uh, share a few considerations about the development of Arctic shipping. Um, I'll share my screen. Uh, shouldn't be too long. OK. 
אוקיי, רגע. So, and then, does everybody see the, the PowerPoint? No. The, the system tells me it is screen sharing. Yeah, it is sharing, Frederick. What do you see? I see my PowerPoint. All right, we see just your file folder. <laughs> this is interesting. Do you have two screens, Frederick? No, only one. Put them on the Can I okay. then just uh, stop share and then share again? Yeah. yeah, I'll try that. See your PowerPoint. The better. From Pron the Diorama. Yeah, bon. perfect. It's working. Okay, good. So, um, a few things I would like to to uh, uh, share with you is the, the fact that first, um, Arctic shipping is indeed developing fast. There's a lot of uh, uh, debate on a, on a lot of um, uh, accounts on documenting this in the media, but I would like to underline the fact it's a, a contrasted development of Arctic shipping we are uh, presently witnessing. So, as I said, it is developing fast. Uh, in the Arctic in general, uh, we saw an increase of 25% of the number of voyages between 2013 and 2019. Uh, this uh, fast increase is taking place in the Russian Arctic, in the Canadian Arctic, in the Greenlandic Arctic as well, in different regions. Uh, so there's a definite general trend towards the increase in traffic. So, however, this masks the fact that the uh, traffic is concentrating in a few specific areas of the, of the Arctic. That leads to the question, what kind of traffic? Why uh, are there some regions uh, witnessing a fast development and others remain virtually empty? Uh, so this map shows the contrasted the densities of ship, uh, Arctic traffic uh, in, in the region. It's from marine traffic. Uh, it's, it displays the traffic for 2019. And it does underline the fact that, as we can see on the map in, in red and orange, uh, marine traffic in the Arctic is indeed, is indeed very concentrated in around Iceland, on the western coast of Greenland, in the sea, uh, Norwegian Sea, Barents Sea, uh, the western part of the Karasis, uh, the Karasi, but other parts of the Arctic are still virtually empty. Uh, the uh, Laptev Sea, the Chukchi Sea, uh, most of the Canadian Ar archipelago, uh, the, the coast north of uh, Alaska, and of course the central Arctic Ocean and that remains still devoid of a much uh, of a significant uh, traffic. So uh, this is in contrast with the, the fact that the, the media keep repeating that there are several routes in the Arctic that could witness a significant uh, development, especially the Central Arctic route uh, that remains virtually not used by commercial traffic, only used by a few icebreakers. And the, the, the Arctic bridge between Murmansk and Churchill with, uh, saw a very limited traffic uh, that was uh, interrupted in, in 2016 when uh, the port of Churchill closed down. It reopened last year, and now the traffic is still very limited. Last year, only three vessels uh, took, uh, stopped over at the Churchill. Uh, traffic is, expand, uh, is, is driven mainly by infrastructure development, especially in Russia, uh, community resupply, and natural resources exploitation, which are elements I'm going to develop in a few, in a few minutes. So a few stats just to illustrate uh, my point here. Um, this is the transit traffic for the Northwest Passage. Uh, it's important to, to uh, come back to the, these figures because the media keep repeating, despite uh, documentation of the, the, the contrary, to, to attestation to the contrary, that um, uh, transit traffic remains very limited. Uh, in the Northwest Passage, we can see here that. Uh, what drives 
the limited Arctic uh, transit traffic in Canada is largely pleasure crafts and adventurers, especially after 2009. But as far as commercial cargo uh, is concerned, uh, it, uh, it rem traffic remains very limited. Uh, general cargo tankers, boat carriers um, account for very f few transits. Um, 2009. And 19, five vessels were recorded, which is close to a record uh, as far as uh, tra transit traffic is concerned in the Canadian uh, archipelago. It must be seen in the future if this is the beginning of a trend upward or if it was just uh, an accident in the general traffic. A preliminary, preliminary results for 2020 show that there will be a collapse of crews and pleasure crafts, mainly because they were banned by the Canadian authorities from entering Canadian waters for fear of um, COVID-19 spreading. As far as transit traffic is concerned in the Northern Sea Route, uh, there, is, uh, there are differences and convergences. First, uh, transit, commercial tra transit traffic took off much later uh, than in the uh, Northwest Passage. Uh, before 2007, they were, there was next to nothing as far as transit traffic is concerned. Um, the activity is much more sustained along the Northern Sea Route now because uh, tra traffic transit took off after 2010, 2011. And also a significant difference is that it is mainly fueled uh, by commercial shipping. Whereas in the, along the Northwest Passage, it is mo mostly pleasure craft that's, that represent uh, the, the bulk of uh, transit traffic. So we see that there was a significant increase up to 2013, then a collapse in the transit traffic, then it's gradually taking on again. And the preliminary results for 2020 just shows that the traffic would be about 62 vessels transiting along the, the, the Northern Sea Route. Now, if we, if we, watch, if we consider the, the total traffic in Canadian waters as a start, you know, contrast with the transit traffic. Uh, it, it underlines the fact that most of the traffic in the Canadian Arctic, as well as, as in Russia, we'll see in, in a few minutes, is fueled by destinational traffic, which is ships that go to the Canadian Arctic to this, to, uh, for, for their, the economic uh, purposes that they're going, why they're coming to the, the Canadian Arctic, load and load cargo, uh, community resupply, and construction of infrastructures. But they, are, they do not go to the, to the Canadian Arctic for transit purposes. So they are not trying, to, the shipping companies are not trying to take advantage of shorter routes. Uh, uh, although, I mean, I keep repeating, this would be the main, advantages of, uh, main advantage of uh, Arctic shipping routes, but rather because they want to perform economic uh, tasks within the Canadian Arctic. And uh, we can see that from this figures that uh, general uh, Cargo traffic is fueled by fishing vessels, which uh, note, uh, incurred a significant expansion uh, from 2007. Cargo vessels uh, from uh, 100 vessels voyages in 2007 to 184 in, in 2020, uh, which is in uh, itself fueled by uh, bulk cargo, general cargo. Uh, the, the figure for bulk cargo 2019-2020 is all the more significant as uh, they, they still witnessed a significant growth despite the closing down of the port of Churchill uh, after 2016. This is mainly due to the expansion of mi the mining activity, especially uh, Deception Bay in northern Quebec and the Mary River Iron Mine in uh, on uh, Baffin, Baffin, Baffin Island. Uh, so it, it definitely uh, general car, uh, general traffic is increasing in the Canadian Arctic, but uh, it's important to underline the fact that it's driven by community resupply, by uh, natural resources extraction, by fishing activities, and definitely not by transit activities. Traffic is also expanding along the Northern Sea Route. Uh, we can see, for instance, that this is of uh, interest for several shipping companies, as attested by permit applications. We see the figures here between 2013 and 2020, uh, displaying first a stable level of interest and a sharp increase for 2020 with uh, 1,022 applications. The number of refusals uh, 
displayed a significant reduction, which may be interpreted with the fact that uh, the shipping companies that remain active in the northern, along the Northern Sea Route are more experimented, so they know uh, better how to com uh, comply with the regulations. It must also be under, uh, underlined the fact that a uh, large majority of vessels plying the, no the Northern Sea Route are Russian flag vessels. Uh, only 156 vessels among those that um, uh, submitted applications were foreign flag vessels in 2020. Sim uh, as for the, the Northwest Passage, destinational traffic is expanding fast along the Northern Sea Route. You can see here the global uh, total tonnage in, in uh, million metric tons along the Northern Sea Route. And with, uh, despite the fact that it was very limited, it was rather limited up to uh, 2013, it now is on a very fast expanding streak with uh, more than 20 million tons in 2018, 31 million tons in 2019. And it is uh, as of October, uh, there were only 23 million tons, but um, a preliminary, preliminary results display uh, tentative figures of about 15 million tons for uh, 2020, which would be very encouraging if it is confirmed. Uh, it's true that the, for the, the Russian authorities, it's very important to expand uh, total tonnage, total traffic along the Northern Sea Route. There are uh, specific uh, regulations that were imposed by uh, the, by the Kremlin so, for, for local authorities to try and develop uh, shipping traffic along the Northern Sea Route. Uh, as for the, um, the Canadian uh, Northwest Passage, you can see here that the transit traffic, although it's much more significant than uh, with the Northwest Passage, is developing rather slowly, much slower than uh, total tonnage traffic uh, along the Northern Sea Route, underlining the fact that here too, uh, transit traffic is of limited interest for uh, shipping companies that rather would uh, prefer the developing destinational traffic with a view to uh, for, uh, to the developing uh, natural resources extraction and community resupply rather than taking advantage of shorter routes for transit traffic. So uh, these conclusions are also apparent with the much detailed uh, maps. It is. Uh, easier to witness here the, the reasons why traffic is developing uh, in the Barents Sea uh, around Svalbard. Uh, it, it is mainly fueled by uh, natural resources extraction schemes, uh, oil and gas extraction, mining activities that are also taking off uh, in northern Norway uh, along the Kola Peninsula with coal, iron and nickel, uh, activities uh, in the western part of the Kara Sea and the, the, the servicing of the oil and gas extraction activities around the Yamal Peninsula. The contrast is stark with the, um, the Canadian Arctic. As I said, uh, there is significant traffic in the western coast of Greenland uh, with fishing, with the servicing of community, with exploration for oil and gas, despite the fact that it's really much more limited now than it used to be a few years ago. Also, we can see the significant traffic generated by the Mary River iron mine uh, around the, the port of Mine Inlet here in, uh, in Baffin Island. Otherwise, the rest of the Canadian archipelago, as you can see, remains largely devoid of traffic. There is a community resupply indeed, but otherwise there is very limited traffic. So it's the same with the northern coast of Alaska, where the traffic remains uh, very limited. Oh, as I said, what drives this uh, traffic, especially in the Russian Arctic, is the, um, uh, the drive for natural resources exploitation, which is largely supported by the Russian government because it wants to uh, develop uh, extraction with the fiscal uh, incentives and economic as an economic driver for the Russian uh, the Russian economy. Uh, we can think, for instance, of the port of Dudinka, which is responsible for the the shipping of nickel uh, ore from the, the Donetsk uh, installations, the Sabeta port in, in the Yamal Peninsula, where, where shipments of uh, natural gas is, uh, is made all, all year long, 
uh, with thanks to the investment in uh, high class vessels. We can think also of oil shipments from the Prilazam Noye platform in the Karasi and other uh, oil fields are going to be developed in the next few years. So it's very likely that indeed traffic is going to increase significantly along the Northern Sea Route with the objective of 80 million tons uh, in uh, 2040, because more and more uh, fields, oil and gas fields and uh, mines are going to, uh, to enter production in the next few years. It can also be witnessed, for instance, with the, this graph, unfortunately, uh, uh, date, uh, beginning to, to date a little bit, that shows that several uh, oil fields are coming online with the, the Varanday uh, oil field, the Prilazam Noye oil field, the Arctic Gate uh, in the Ob in the, uh, Delta, and shipments of oil are gradually increasing. Uh, figures are much higher now, and this accounts also for the increase in uh, commercial traffic along the Northern Sea Route, oil, gas, um, uh, iron ore, nickel ore, are, uh, and coal within a few, a few years are going to account for the expansion of uh, shipping traffic in the Northern Sea Route. As I said, mining is expanding too. Uh, uh, the media uh, give large accounts with uh, about oil and gas exploitation. Uh, this is not completely new. Uh, Duninka was founded in, uh, in in the 1930s, um, and it was used to uh, to send nickel uh, nickel ore ship, uh, production from uh, uh, Norilsk. Dixon is also going to be a uh, uh, significant part for the extraction the shipments of uh, 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 coal um, that is going to be to, to be extracted in the Taimir Peninsula. Uh, there's a new mine that's going to be opened in 2023 um, in the Novaya Zemlya archipelago. So the Russians have grand visions and project schemes for natural resources uh, extraction in, in Siberia. It remains to be seen if all these projects are going to, to go ahead because of constraints of uh, uh, world prices for natural resources, but they do intend to try and develop these resources and fuel uh, commercial cargo along the Northern Sea Route. In Canada, traffic is also fueled, as I said, uh, with the natural resources extraction. I mentioned the Mary River uh, iron mine. Um, there are uh, nickel mines in Northern Quebec. There are a few other uh, projects, but uh, the, the likelihood of their uh, going ahead is very limited because precisely of depressed uh, well prices for natural uh, resources. So as a conclusion, I would like to underline the fact that natural resources exploitation is uh, likely to generate substantial traffic level, especially in Russia. Uh, natural resources exploitation is the main driver for uh, Arctic shipping presently. It's definitely, definitely not the transit shipping. Um, this brings new shipping companies, a few new shipping companies because of the need to develop uh, cargo cap uh, shipping capacity. But these new shipping companies uh, must be, uh, must have some experience and must invest in uh, higher uh, ice class vessels. But that accounts for the limited number of shipping companies that are actually active in the, um, in the Arctic market. So we uh, may mention a few of them, for instance, Nordic bulk that display the significant interest for the time of coal extraction in Russia. You can mention also the Canadian company TK, uh, of course, Costco and China merchants that's, uh, that, invest, that invested in the exploitation scheme in the Yamal Peninsula, the Japanese company Mitsui uh, for Yamal as well. Development of traffic just depends more on corporate strategies. Are the, the companies uh, really willing to de develop new sites as far as mining and oil and gas companies. And this will in, uh, in, in turn uh, trigger significant levels of nat uh, natural resources uh, expedition. It also depends on government intervention here, mainly in Russia, to what extent are uh, respective governments willing to support natural resources extraction. Uh, in Canada, 
the, the, in the, gov the federal government and the territorial governments are interested in, in the development of natural resources extraction, but will not provide significant subsidies to support this activity, whereas in Russia, uh, the involvement in the fed of the federal government is much more important than it is elsewhere in the Arctic. And it also depends on world resource prices. This is where we see the, a significant link between uh, extraction, which Pauline is going to, to explain, world prices and the development of shipping. If world prices are going up, then there will be much more activity as far as the natural resources extraction is concerned, and there will be more uh, shipping in the Arctic. If resources, world prices, world resources prices, sorry, remain depressed or low, as we can see right now, uh, then Arctic shipping is not going to take off, contrary to what has been claimed by uh, several media accounts uh, ever since the ice has begun to melt in the Arctic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lassa. Always, always interesting uh, with data and always adding subtleties to uh, narratives that we hear and a lot of, of, I think, misunderstandings we have about shipping and, and the like. Uh, always more complicated than, <laughs> than those grand narratives. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I just to repeat for, for uh, um, uh, people that, that listen um, and participate, you can always ask questions at the bottom of the screen in the Q&A section. Um, and we're going to look at them and then, and then ask them at, at the end of the panel, uh, whether it's for Professor Lassa or for other uh, panelists. So we'll turn to our second, a second topic uh, after shipping uh, military operations and acquisitions. So I'll give, uh, I'll give the podium to Adam uh, McDonald and Thomas. Okay, uh, great. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for being here. And thank you, Matthew, for organizing and inviting Thomas and I today to uh, speak about Arctic military developments in 2020. And I'm going to start uh, the first half of the presentation, and then Thomas will finish uh, with the second part. So COVID-19 had a sizable impact on military activities during the first few months of 2020 uh, and continues to do so in some ways to this day, but has not really derailed the overall trajectory of action in the region in this regard. Indeed, 2020 amplified and deepened three interrelated trends in military affairs, which are and will continue to uh, continue to affect the geopolitical and security situation in the region for the foreseeable future. These are number one, these emerging seams between Arctic subregions as sites of increased military activity and focus, and relatedly the growing gaps in terms of military jurisdiction and responsibility, particularly among the Western Arctic states. Number two, the continued development and deployment of advanced weaponry in the Arctic, specifically uh, hypersonic missiles, which continue to blur the offense defense balance in the region and beyond. And number three, the overall increasing military presence and posture uh, in the Arctic. So I'm gonna cover points one and two, and Thomas will cover the third trend and then finish by commenting on growing calls for and the need of regional institutions, initiatives and protocols pertaining to military affairs to avoid uh, accidents and misunderstandings. So to begin with seams and gaps, there's three uh, Arctic sub-regional environments with distinct climates, levels of industrialization, demography, and different security and strategic realities. These are the North American Arctic, the European Arctic, which is also known as the High North, and the Eurasian or the Russian Arctic. There are military developments occurring uh, within all of these, but it's particularly between them in these border regions, these seams as we call them, which are becoming growing sites of competitive military posturing and positioning. Some of these include things like the Barents Sea, uh, Greenland, particularly US attempts to try to curb any sort of Chinese influence there, and potentially one day the Central Arctic Ocean. But the focus of the last number of years, and particularly in 2020, continues to be on the Norwegian and the Barents Sea, which is a meeting place between the Eurasian and the European Arctics. And this is of growing importance to both Russia and the other Western uh, Arctic states. Uh, for Russia, this, this waterway is really important for two reasons. One is the construction and extension of its bastion strategy meant to protect its uh, ballistic missile um, uh, submarine force. And secondly, it's to allow access into uh, the North Atlantic for its naval and air forces. For NATO, this, these waters are also extremely important, particularly because of the defense of the northern flank of NATO, particularly in Norway, and any sort of attempt to try to defeat uh, Russian abilities to impose anti-access and area denial bubbles, or A2AD, uh, which would engulf Norway. 
As well, uh, NATO countries are very interested in monitoring Russian naval and air activity into and out of the Arctic, particularly to ensure that sea lines of communication between North America and Europe are not disrupted by Russian activity. In 2020, in particular, we started seeing a couple exercises between some Arctic NATO and non-Arctic NATO countries in the Barents Sea, and in particular in relative close proximity to Murmansk uh, in Russia, which is their uh, base of the Northern Fleet and home to their nuclear ballistic submarine forces. Whether this is gonna to continue to be a trend in the future or was just a one-off is yet to be seen, but something that we should be trying to focus uh, on is whether or not NATO continues to start focusing more northwards and in closer proximity to Russia in this regard, shifting focus somewhat uh, from the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap, which has been the traditional area of focus for the last number of decades towards more uh, a small barred uh, Norway region known as the Bear Gap to try to monitor and if needed to um, defeat and deter Russian uh, naval and air forces there. Again, a lot of the strategic rationales for this are based on this idea of trying to penetrate these anti-access and area, area denial bubbles that the West thinks that Russia is trying to build around these regions, uh, which could legitimate and maybe necessitate in some eyes shifting forces closer to Russia and Russian waters, particularly surveillance and weaponry. And here, something to look for in the future is that the Central Arctic Ocean becomes um, more uh, accessible and navigable, whether or not there'll be pushes to build and then deploy uh, certain forces, uh, particularly naval forces, to operate uh, in this region along these waters for these purposes. So these seams, as I said, are creating gaps in military priority, responsibility, and jurisdiction for all the Arctic states. For Russia, the Northern Fleet is set to become a full military district in 2021 but how it'll operate alongside other districts with jurisdiction in parts of the Arctic as well, particularly the central and eastern districts, is yet to be seen. This is particularly important as the Northern Sea Route and indeed the entire Arctic Russian coastline continues to become a growing military focus for Russia and whether or not this will necessitate changes in command and control organizations towards more of a combatant commander structure rather than the current administrative structures uh, which are based on the districts. A second issue that Russia faces is any sort of increased stationing and deployment of forces in the Arctic takes away from those being deployed elsewhere, particularly land and air assets on its western border near Europe and the Caucasus, and also some competition amongst naval allocation of resources to reconstitute the Northern Fleet versus expanding the Black Sea Fleet and also reviving uh, their fleet and Vladivostok in Asia. Uh, second, uh, in terms of NATO, we saw the establishment of the Atlantic Command uh, this year with focus and responsibility for the Atlantic Ocean and the European Arctic. It seems very clear that any sort of uh, official NATO focus and role in the Arctic would be in this area of the European uh, Arctic, with the North American Arctic still falling under the bilateral focus of the US and Canada. Uh, however, there's growing needs and desires to develop, uh, integrate and share surveillance technologies, assets and systems to support North American and European defense and how the Arctic uh, works in that way and who would be responsible for what uh, is yet to be seen. Uh, within North America, there's also some kind of gaps emerging. Within the United States, there's been some talk amongst commanders from US NORTHCOM, which is responsible for continental defense, uh, of trying to create a hierarchy of combatant commanders who have jurisdiction over the Arctic, particularly them privileging um, NORTHCOM in being able to direct uh, assets from other uh, jurisdictions to support continental defense. And it's unclear if that's gonna get any traction or what that's gonna mean for the future of how the US organizes itself in the Arctic and maybe even in other regions. Um, another possible gap is in the US-Canada defense relationship, particularly given the modernization of NORAD and the re-examination of continental defense itself. And I think here uh, an interesting focus is to see if NORAD moves uh, towards a more offense for defense posture in which they try to, or maybe nudge towards conducting operations off continent uh, in order to counteract some of these advanced weapon systems, particularly hypersonics, which may cause some concerns amongst uh, Canadian decision makers who may not want to participate in that. And therefore, whether Canada can maintain this plug and play ability to, to plug into some systems of NORAD and continental defense, but not into others such as uh, ground-based missile defense. Whether this is going to be able, uh, whether this is going to be possible moving forward is unclear as there's a as there's pressures building towards kind of whole system integration, the blurring between cruise and ballistic missile distinctions because of hypersonics, and the need to decide new system upgrades for NORAD, and indeed rethinking the future of continental defense writ large for emerging domains such as cyber. 
These themes and gaps are not unprecedented. Many of them existed during the Cold War and thus an institutional memory does exist, uh, hopefully to help avoid tit for tat developments which unnecessarily amplify security dilemma, dilemma, uh, security dilemma dynamics uh, with defensive measures of one being interpreted as offensive in nature by the other. And this feeds into the second point about advanced technologies and the offense defense balance. The US is increasingly concerned about Russia and Chinese development of hypersonics. These are missiles with accelerated flight times and the US nor its allies has any effective defense against them. And these could be deployed uh, in, in the uh, Arctic uh, by Russia and others, uh, simply because of the close geographic proximity between the uh, Russian, uh, European and North American continents there. And this has led to some concerns amongst US decision makers that if these weapons were used, particularly in the Arctic, there would be little uh, time to make decisions on how to respond. And because of this, this may embolden Russia or China to use or threaten to use these weapons to, to deter and disrupt American support to overseas allies by being able to strike North America with conventional weapons systems. Um, this has generated conversations uh, amongst the United States and its NATO partners about the greater need for a comprehensive and real-time surveillance in developing a common operating picture to detect these weapons and platforms that uh, deploy them, as well as a debate about whether the focus should be on defense in terms of building interceptors and other defeat mechanisms, or whether the focus should be on offense and retaliatory capabilities, including building their own hypersonic missiles to deter their use and influence by adversaries. Uh, this debate could be leading to a determination that they, they need to engage these platforms at their source, potentially in other countries' soil, leading to the placement possibly of surveillance and weapons platforms in close proximity to Russia and or China. And thus this offense for defense posture may cause consternation with Russia, which feels that this is some type of encroachment um, on their waters and territory. Um, there's a number of concerning developments by Russia and China about hypersonics, including the strategic and operational rationales for deploying and building them. But there also needs to be an understanding of the potential that the US or NATO strategy uh, could be that defense is interpreted as being invulnerable. That is trying to become immune to these weapons while being able to use them against others rather than accepting some degree of mutual vulnerability exist with these new weapon systems. Um, and thus there needs to be greater focus on the need to think about how both sides uh, could be contributing towards destabilizing the strategic environment uh, in the Arctic and elsewhere, given these advanced weapons. And so now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Thomas, who's going to speak to the latter part of our um, chapter on military developments. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Adam. Uh, it's great to see everyone here, um, or at least see a bunch of grey boxes with everyone's names in, which I think is kind of par for the course these days. But uh, thanks again. <laughs> there we go. Hello, Winnie. Um, thanks Thanks also to, to echo Adam's point. Thanks to Matthew for, for inviting us along to this. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. So um, I'm very much aware that time is ticking, so I shall be as brief as, as possible. And to pick up on a couple of uh, Adam's points, what I would like to talk about for the next few minutes uh, is to start with the kind of the pattern of military activities that we've seen, particularly regarding exercises uh, in the Arctic. And fear, fear not, I'm not going to just list off every exercise that has occurred in the Arctic, because that would be tremendously dull. Uh, I would suggest, of course, reading Adam and my piece. Um, it's a thrilling read in every possible regard. Uh, that perhaps gives a little more information on some of the, the key exercises, I think, that, that have occurred this year. But um, hopefully I'll try to, to, to draw out some of the trends, particularly around the, the language that's been used around exercises and what we can learn from them. Uh, and then the second part, I want to kind of get on my soapbox for a couple of minutes uh, and talk about some institutions which I think might be of real value, um, given what, what is to me seemingly uh, an increasingly risky uh, region. So um, to start from the beginning, we've once again seen an increase in military activities in the Arctic in 2020. That's a kind of dull statement. We knew it was going to happen. It, it's, it's been part of the pattern for the last few years, and even COVID hasn't disrupted a huge amount. Um, frankly, if you're not all sick of me, and I'm fortunate enough to be invited back next year, I would be absolutely shocked if we couldn't start with the same statement again. It's, it, this is what is going on in the Arctic. But what I think is particularly noticeable this year is that we've seen uh, a lot of language around uh, the biggest since, or the first since, the first exercise here since. Um, particularly this year around naval exercises. Now, um, for me, my, my big fear is that we interpret those actions as pointing absolutely to a preparation for combat in the Arctic. 
Uh, what we, I think, as kind of academics in particular, need to look at is what these exercises actually mean. What's the real rationale behind uh, what's going on? We absolutely they're about enhancing combat capabilities. A military exercise, it has to. That's kind of the, the fundamental, <clears throat> excuse me, fundamental function. But I think it's a bit more than that as well. Uh, and a great example of this was uh, a Russian high altitude parachute drop that happened in April this year. Um, it, it had quite a lot of kind of concerned coverage in, in a number of places. And, and technologically, it was deeply impressive. It was really, really cool. On a practical basis, though, I think there are some questions remain about where its value is, particularly in the North American Arctic. Um, and you know, this isn't the heroes of Telemark style. You're not gonna drop some parachutists in and then watch them cross country ski to Sweden. This is a very, very different environment. And also if we imagine that being used in a conflict that would be foreshadowing a continental scale conflict between Russia and the United States. And that's something which pretty much every analyst that I've spoken to has kind of suggested is deeply unlikely. So what was it actually about that exercise that got everyone concerned? Why were we talking about it? <clears throat> so I think we need to be really careful not to make that inherent leap between somebody conducting a military exercise and then assuming that they're anticipating using it in offensive in an offensive manner, particularly the same way we don't assume that um, US, UK anti-submarine exercises are immediately going to presage the dropping of a depth charge on a Russian submarine in the next couple of months. We need to just be careful about what we uh, interpret from those exercises. So what did they tell us? I think, frankly, what we have seen this year is an awful lot of posturing. It had been planned for a little while, exercises take a while to plan, but it is a lot of posturing. There, there are a lot of governments demonstrating that they are very much aware of the Arctic as a site of real significance and one in which there are real competing interests at stake and that they are prepared to engage in that competition. By putting all that money and effort into those activities, it, it quite simply just symbolizes their perception of the importance of the region. But the, the critical bit for us, I think, is that with that military component, it's, it's signaling that it's not simply a region of competition, but one of contestation. And that takes us in a slightly different direction and, and one I think we need to be really wary of. So to be clear, I, I'm not suggesting that we should ignore the capability of aspect of, of military exercises in the Arctic. And I think Adam's presentation summed up quite nicely why that, that is definitely not the case. Um, we, we really do need to have a handle on what developments are being made, but we also need to ensure that we don't see those developments through a lens that assumes that outright conflict is absolutely inevitable, and particularly that military uh, capability is the only way to create stability. Because if we can't do that, then, then I, I think the Arctic will become probably the purest example of unwanted escalation since probably Europe in the 1910s. Um, that's an academic hill I'm prepared to die on in a Q&A session. Um, so we have to stop and ask ourselves, I think, how it is we're interpreting the actions of other, others in the Arctic, but also how they're interpreting what we are doing. I'm talking from a North American perspective, despite my accent. So what are those lessons that can be drawn from our accent? Uh, actions. And if that lesson is they are preparing for combat, then we need to start treading very, very carefully indeed. And I think that that provides the step up onto my soapbox, if you like. Um, again, not to put too fine a point on it, I think this is really dangerous. We're, we're seeing a, a situation in which military activity is increasing. And frankly, we're seemingly seeing a threat from, from all directions. Um, not to blow smoke where it's not wanted, but I think the next speaker's breakdown of the, the Arctic threat into threats to in and through the Arctic is a, is a really good start. But we also need to go down that next stage and, and, and really drill into what it is we are concerned about happening in the Arctic. What it is that we're seeing that links into those concerns and critically, what needs to happen in order for those concerns to be mitigated. And that last step, I think, is really, really important. Because as it stands, rising fears about the militarization of the Arctic is, is quite simply leading to more military assets being put into the Arctic. And it's not necessarily a great pattern. Um, so in dealing with that, I would suggest we might like to think about looking across the Arc, uh, looking across the Atlantic to the European um, model of confidence and security building measures. Now that, that regime is certainly not perfect. There are some huge holes in there, which I'll not go into here, but that base concept of a framework that being instituted that, that sets a foundation of 
openness and transparency and, and opens military activity up to some sort of formal scrutiny seems to hold some merit given what we're seeing up there at the moment. If nothing else, um, understanding planned activities probably helps us to avoid accidents. And given the Arctic environment, that is hugely significant. But reducing that risk of miscalculation and misperception is really, really important. We need to be careful that the defence benefits of that aren't asymmetric, for sure. But by creating some form of regulatory framework, I think we might also start to get to the position where we can really be open in addressing the question of why we are concerned. And it might give a little bit more exposure to some of that dual use infrastructure that seems to have uh, come up as a point of particular concern. And finally, uh, if nothing else, I think setting up that sort of agreed framework, I suggest probably principles rather than rules based, but again, it's a conversation for another day. But that sort of thing can, can create a tripwire um, which the, the breach of those regulations is um, demonstrates that any actor who's doing that breaching is deviating from a behavior that has already been agreed as providing a buffer against escalation uh, and thereby indicates a shift of in the political landscape. And it's that that then can provide a foundation for action rather than basing it solely on an interpretation of an intent from a consideration of what we perceive to be a capability. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam and, and Thomas. And yes, Thomas, uh, all of these operations and, and didn't list them all, it's, it, but for sure, uh, for those, uh, for, for the ones, uh, people attending, they're gonna be in the final report, probably published next, uh, next week in French, but uh, the two military chapters will be also published in English. So uh, we'll make that available on our website at OPSA and Natsen. Um, and through our social media outlets as well, for sure. Thank you very much for that discussion. I think it raised, uh, I see a question there in the chat. I also had a few questions it raised that, you know, just makes the, <laughs> um, raises a lot of questions about how to answer to, to military activities and rising up. Thank you. Um, transitioning to a team that is pretty close to, to military operations and necklaces in general, uh, I'll turn it to uh, Whitney Lackenbar, Troy Wolfar, and, and Nancy Keeble to talk about uh, North American defense, so focusing a bit more on North America and zeroing in on that region uh, for defense relationships. Thank you, Matthew. Let me share the screen here. Okay. Uh... On behalf of the group, um, we are going to present uh, on behalf of Dr. Lockenbauer, and hopefully if there's time for questions and answers, he can jump in. The schedule is kind of iffy, um, but Nancy and I were able to, to cover down. Uh, thank you for inviting us uh, to this discussion. It's, it's quite timely. Uh, I think an annual review is very effective. Um, and so far the discussion has been great. Um, hopefully, uh, we can add to this. And to start off, we'd like to talk about the purpose, uh, obviously, is to highlight what happened in 2020, adding to the previous speakers. Uh, we'll try to keep this short uh, out of respect to the, the next panelist, uh, Pauline, too. So let's start off with uh, the agenda here. We'll talk about Canada, United States, and a combined look at uh, North American and Arctic defense, and largely um, produced off of our paper, which is available that Matthew just talked about. I'll start off with Canada, and when we look at what, what happened in 2020 that's notable, especially, um, we look at Arctic and Northern policy framework kind of being the, the lead national effort um, from Canada that is sort of a continuation extension of Strong, Secure, and Engaged uh, from 2017, and this particular uh, strategy, this document really provides for a northern focus where indigenous communities uh, have inclusive inputs and there's a concerted effort from the national government to look at those priority issues for Canada and, and ensuring that the right voices, all the stakeholders, key and primary, um, have input uh, to, to what are Canada's leading priorities as as we know them now and as they are developing, uh, which Dr. Tebow will talk about uh, in, a, in a few minutes. So 
one thing that uh, we've learned, and, and this is Dr. Lockenbauer's um, brainchild, is really looking at how to understand the Arctic. This is something so many of us have been doing for many years and thinking about threats right? uh, and developing threats, emerging threats. It's not been an easy task to do this, especially in ways that we can wrap our heads around, uh, containerize and, dis and discuss and develop our strategies. And to his credit, he came up with a really good way to do this, known as two through and in the Arctic. And these are separate categories of how to think about activity, especially defense related or threats when it comes to the Arctic, because these are very distinct, uh, especially when it comes to through the Arctic, where many of the world's experts kind of feel like this is if there's going to be an escalation as previous discuss, as previously discussed, it's, it's going to be kind of one of those through um approaches where the threat uh comes from outside in because as we know it right now there's just very little um chance for conflict in the arctic over arctic issues uh, given the uh, significant stability throughout the region there are uh, clearly developing situations but largely i think the community thinks that threats will be coming from outside in spillover effect uh in common dialogue right now with regard to the United States, in 2020, uh, we saw the US Air, Air Force Arctic Strategy published. And this was um, the first Air Force Arctic Strategy published, and it largely spoke to uh, much of its continuing North uh, American and national defense requirements, not so much Arctic focused. And other notable aspects were the integration and thinking of space. Uh, and, and as a space force, United States Space Force stands up, it, it, this is not the first time the United States think about space and all of these uh, components and joint levels have had space commands. Uh, it's just shifting down as Space Force builds its house. Uh, we will see how that develops. Um, with regard to the US Army, Army Arctic strategy, that's supposed to come out maybe tomorrow. Um, and I've been working with the uh, commanders on, on reviewing this, this is not going to be a very telling document as far as where the Army is going with regard to the Arctic. What it's going to do is provide a baseline understanding of where the Army is, where the Army's been, to include exercises that Thomas just talked about. Uh, we're outlining those. A lot of efforts that were either opportunistic or in line with national defense efforts, not so much Arctic defined. And that's kind of the key understanding when it comes to this. Uh, but it's important to baseline these so as the first uh, this being the first strategy for the u.s army it can work off of that once the national security strategy sort of has specific arctic language in it then the joint and service components throughout the u.s department of defense can actually pursue uh, funded operational requirements capabilities especially very difficult and um, proficiencies. At this point, we're not really at that. A lot of things are converging. The momentum's there for sure. And we know this uh, largely, General Van Herc. This is a new development also, just took command of NORAD Northcom, uh, binational command, uh, where he reports not only to the Secretary of Defense of the United States, but also the Minister of Defense of Canada. And also uh, one of his subordinate sub-unified joint commands, ALCOM, General Crum, Lieutenant General Crum just took command also. So he had a major development in the command structure in North America and the United States. With regard to Canada, I, I think at this point, if, if I'm up to date, uh, I don't believe uh, the Chief of Defense for Canada has been, um, General Vance's replacement has been named yet. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Teeple. Thanks very much, Troy. What an exciting opportunity to present to this uh, excellent group today. Um, so I'll just sort of jump in. Uh, a recent statement by a NORAD official is that uh, the world, it's not just that the world is changing, but that the world has changed, uh, which has both global and regional implications. But the new emphasis, even though we're looking kind of regionally in North America, they talk about this kind of global element. Um, you know, Troy introduced the uh, the form uh, the new uh, incoming uh, commander of NORAD and U.S. Northcom, but the former uh, commander, uh, General Terence O'Shaughnessy, was stated uh, to the um, 
Senate Armed Services Committee back in March that the Arctic is an avenue of approach for threat factors to North America as discussed uh, by air, by maritime approaches, so through. Um, and these threats uh, are advanced, you know, air launch cruise missiles, uh, sea launch cruise missiles, new advanced ballistic missiles, hypersonic live vehicles, as earlier discussed, and of course, unmanned aerial systems. And the challenge that these systems pose is that they're faster and they're more maneuverable, and right now there's no defense that exists against them. Um, General Shaughnessy states the Arctic is no longer a fortress wall and our oceans are no longer protective moats. Uh, the homeland is no longer a sanctuary. So this demonstrates how the world has changed. So Canada maintains a close uh, defense partnership with the United States uh, in various ways. Uh, of course, the Binational NORAD Command, the Tri-Command Structure comprising NORAD, CJOC, and US NORTHCOM, and a series of bilateral defense cooperative, cooperative initiatives through uh, MOUs, and of course, consultations through the Permanent Joint Board of Defense. Um, as noted, the ANFP and SSE affirm Canada's commitment to modernizing NORAD, although how this is moving forward is, is um, still up in the air, especially with the unfunded component of NORAD modernization in SSE. Uh, NORAD obviously is central to North America and Arctic defense and security. Uh, General O'Shaughnessy argues that we require advanced sensor capabilities to detect and track platforms that carry missile and unmanned vehicle threats to North America, as noted by, you know, air, air and sea platforms, aircraft, ships, submarines. Um, defeat mechanisms, therefore, are also required to counter and disarm advanced uh, threat systems located in and passing through the Arctic, including, uh, you know, the, into the homelands of our adversaries, a new concept. So the changing nature of the threats requires a revisit to defense and deterrence posture, which is being done in the United States and is required here in Canada. This necessitates a paradigmatic shift um, by the defense enterprise requiring technological innovation and modernization of current capabilities. Um, as noted, sensors are needed to be upgraded to detect threats from over the horizon as early as possible in their launch phases. And the aging, right now, the aging North warning system cannot carry out this advanced function. It needs to be upgraded or replaced uh, with a layered system of sensors. Uh, the Arctic region poses significant challenges, however, uh, to sensor upgrades due to extreme weather, um, the challenges of operating in polar orbits, and of course, the lack of infrastructure to accommodate sensors by land, sea, air, and space. Uh, so within the context of the changing nature of the threats uh, and the need to evolve North American defense, U.S. NORTHCOM and NORAD pr are promoting new concepts uh, to keep pace with adversaries uh, in their advances in offensive capabilities. Um, uh, you, many of you are aware of the new SHIELD concept, the Strategic Homeland Integrated Ecosystem for Layer Defense. Uh, this concept promotes a new defense and deterrence posture for an integrated system of systems involving, of course, enhanced domain awareness. Uh, joint all domain command and control, that's the JADC2 you've probably heard about, uh, and defeat mechanisms. And this, these are um, part of this whole system of systems to respond to new threats that can launch both conventional and nuclear payloads, and that's important to be aware of. Uh, this concept pivots to deterrence by denial with a doctrine that emphasizes offensive options to strike at adversaries' platforms. This is what Andrea Sharon and Jim Ferguson call um, striking the archers uh, rather than just the arrows. And it's also embodied in this concept of left of launch, um, a concept that's considered more cost effective and efficient than a right of launch approach that targets the or intercepts the arrows, the, for example, cruise missiles. It's better to, to strike out the platform before they're even launched. Um, so the components of uh, SHIELD being domain awareness, as, I, as noted, it's a layered system of sensors from seabed to orbit that can use current new capabilities to generate data, providing detection and tracking uh, data from the best or any sensor to be used by commanders in decisions to responding to the threats. CHAD-C2 is focused on using data for decision making by commanders. Uh, the emphasis is on faster processing of information from all sensors using machine learning, artificial intelligence, and predictive analytical capabilities. Um, this provides uh, options to decision makers at the speed of relevance uh, and moves the decision making space more to the left. This allows more time to consider the best responses. Um, and this concept creates what's known as the information advantage and decision superiority uh, relative to the adversary. Uh, regarding defeat mechanisms, this involves a multitude of options being explored to dis deny or disrupt adversaries' launch capabilities. And this uh, moves from traditional kinetic to non-kinetic options. Uh, recently, uh, the new NORAD, command, NORAD and NORTHCOM commander, General Van Hurt, expressed uh, the challenges of relying too much on kinetic options. 
Uh, he suggests exploring non-kinetic options such as the electromagnetic spectrum, as well as exploiting the information domain, and that's significant. Um, he notes that the information domain uh, contributes to decision superiority by creating doubt in the mind of the adversary about his ability to achieve his objective. Uh, and this concept gets into the gray space, uh, which could use information to manage various stages of a conflict or de-escalate a conflict. Um, and the idea is influencing the adversary's decision loop. Uh, so essentially, NORAD modernization involves the three, uh, the main elements, four main elements of uh, changes in command and control, the renewal of the North Warning System, Canada's recently ex exp uh, expansion of the, the CADIS, the Canadian Air uh, Defense Identification Zone to cover more broadly the archipelago, um, and of course, SHIELD and JADC2. Uh, these efforts uh, or these uh, initiatives affect the future of NORAD, um, its early warning role, and possibly the expansion of its mission uh, to offensive roles beyond North America as part of deterrence by denial. Um, the other speakers touched a little bit on this, but it's about um, looking at an offensive role in engaging platforms outside of our territory, um, possibly into the territory of our adversaries, such as Russia. Um, and Troy, uh, Troy had spoken a little bit about the Arctic strategies of the DOD, uh, Navy, the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, the Air Force, and the forthcoming Arctic strategy, um, and how they reflect the U.S. pivot to the Arctic heating, uh, O'Shaughnessy's warning that the Arctic is an avenue of approach that cannot be ignored. So at this, that's about seven minutes for me. I will pass it back to Troy to conclude. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. So the, that's really what's kind of going on. It's 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 the clarity of what these defense are not clear. Um, I've been through five or six different combat commanders now working for Northcom uh, and several Alcom commanders, and the struggle to define capabilities before it can even be funded is incredibly difficult, especially when our adversaries are advancing the threats uh, almost faster than we can deal with them. And so much so that they're, they're almost changing. They're, they're new generations of threats that are uh, making us look at the entire enterprise of North American defense, not easy. And when you put that on top of the, the political aspects of decision-making and funding in both nations and combined, uh, it just adds to the complexity. So, um, the more work we all do, the better. I think it helps to inform the community and the commanders. So thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, for this presentation. Really interesting, and especially combined with uh, what uh, Adam and, and Thomas talked about. A lot of, of questions pop in my mind. Uh, keep that for the Q&A. Uh, I'll turn now to uh, uh, Pauline Pick for, uh, to talk about uh, natural resources. And I think we'll see some parallel with the first presentation on shipping. Okay, do you all see my PowerPoint? Good. So this is going to be a, a review about uh, resource exploration, exploitation and developing trends in the sector for the year 2020. So uh, basically, we outline in our paper three main elements uh, that affected the resource sector in the year 2020. The first one would be obviously the global pandemic, which even though if we, it was not disruptive, it still affected um, the, the resource sector. The second one would be a significant variation in global prices, which is obviously linked to the global pandemic, but not only, and uh, which is also linked to the third element that we would like to outline, which is local, national and international geopolitics. Um, so as we can see on this tweet, which is in French, and I do apologize for that, uh, but this tweet is from the uh, 5th of December. And as we can see from it, the image of the Arctic as a resource El Dorado is still very much alive. However, developments in the sector this year especially show that if exploration is still indeed underway, exploitation is not always profitable. Uh, many elements hamper the development of the resource sector, and many companies have actually left the region, stopping all projects altogether. So this idea of a resource El Dorado must therefore be discussed in light of this year's development, which is what we intend to do in our paper and very rapidly in this presentation. Um, and we're, with that, we're going to start with the impact of the pandemic on the resource sector. 
So mine were, uh, were very early on uh, identified as hotspot, a hotspot sorry, for the spread of the, of the virus. And uh, I'm going to discuss mainly two examples from northern Norway, uh, where uh, exploration is actually going on uh, this year. So you have on the right side of the screen uh, the Björn Vatten, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, uh, mine, which is exploited since uh, 1910, uh, and where all activities stopped in 1997. And activities were actually supposed to restart in the beginning of uh, 2020, but then with the pandemic, everything stopped. Um, because the prices uh, went down and because the, the workforce could not get there. Uh, they were hoping to start over, uh, they are hoping that now that things are settling down, uh, they, were, they are going to be able to start operations in the beginning of the year 2021. And this is going to be something that we need to follow. Uh, on the left side of the screen, you have the Nusser mine, which uh, is a copper mine also uh, based in Northern Norway. Uh, it also got a new exploitation license in 2019, and it was supposed as well to start operations in the first quarter of 2020. However, the pandemic led to a dramatic fall in copper prices, and then the start of operation was postponed. Uh, but then copper prices uh, bounced back again in the second quarter, and now the director of the mine is confident that activities are going to start soon. But what, it, what we can see with those two examples is that the pandemic, yes, affected the workforce, especially the fly-in, fly-out type of workforce, but it also affected uh, global prices and transportation, which is bound to have an impact on the entire sector. However, if the pandemic was, was an important element uh, for the development uh, of resource exploitation and exploration this year, many other elements affected the sector. And then in the, in the second spot, we're going to uh, see uh, local, national and international um, politics. And so we're going to start with the larger scale and local geopolitics, uh, which are playing a very important role, especially in Scandinavia, for the development of the, of the sector. Um, so the, proje the projects that we just mentioned were granted licenses in 2019 and were supposed to start in 2020. Um, but those licenses were rapidly contested by Sami communities, especially for the Björnvatten mine. Uh, Sami communities especially denounce a lack of consultation uh, as those projects might conflict with their traditional use of land and especially reindeer herding. Um, and this issue is getting even more complex because prospection uh, in Scandinavia is in intensifying, uh, looking for rare earth metal, metals such as palladium, lithium, cobalt or nickel, uh, as those uh, metals are used to produce energy efficient equipment as part of energ energetic transition policies. Uh, so in, a, in an interview for the Arctic Council in June 2020, uh, the president of the Sami Council expresses concern about the economic consequences of the pandemic, and she underlines that governments must listen to indigenous communities and avoid relegating consultation to the background, uh, prioritizing economic recovery at all costs. And I think that would be something very interesting to follow in the year 2020 on the resource sector for um, development in, in Scandinavia. Uh, it's important, though, not to be uh, overly simplistic about indigenous communities and resource extraction, because obviously, uh, even in Scandinavia, but as well in other parts of the Arctic, uh, indigenous communities do support exploitation as long as it benefits communities as well. Uh, then if we uh, look at a little uh, smaller scale, uh, so we can think about national geopolitics, and they also came into play when it comes to resource extraction in 2020. Uh, so we chose here the example of Greenland for the sake of the presentation, however, this is not only true for Greenland. But then again, in Greenland, resource extraction has been seen by the self-government as the key to achieving independence since the 2008 agreement. And I think that the election of Eric Jensen last week at the head of the Sumut party only re reinforces this trend. Independence is a priority for Greenland and resource exploitation is key. Um, it must be discussed in light of the numbers uh, and stats that we can see for the, this year. Uh, in 2020, only two mines uh, were left in activities in Greenland, uh, and uh, oil exploration halted uh, completely in uh, 2020 as all companies uh, left. So the map that we have here uh, associated with the table uh, extracted from the Greenland Resource Assessment Data Portal 
shows that uh, new projects for exploration are set to begin. However, we must keep in mind that it's very expensive and most companies stop this year exploration activities. So this is also a development that is going to be interesting uh, to follow for the, for the coming year. And now if we focus on the, on the larger scale, uh, international uh, geopolitics, we can obviously think that they also came into play, uh, slowing sometimes the development of new projects. And I chose here the example of the buyout of TMAC gold mine in Nunavut by the Chinese company uh, Shenzhen Gold. Um, so security implication of this buyout uh, are currently being evaluated by, uh, evaluated, sorry, by Ottawa. Uh, and they just uh, announced that they would extend the delay before rendering their conclusion. So most signs indicate, obviously, that it would probably be just a commercial acquisition. Um, however, it's, uh, it's interesting to note that uh, there would be such an evaluation. And it reminds us that resource exploitation in the Arctic remains a, very much a political issue. Uh, the last element that I would like to underline would be, obviously, international crisis, which is a key variable when it comes to the development of, resource, of the resource sector in the Arctic. So uh, as we can see on this graph, prices uh, of all major resources dropped in the first quarter of 2020 because of the pandemic and because uh, of a price war between uh, OPIC country, uh, OPEC sorry, country. Basically, we had too much oil in the system and too little demand for it. Uh, this is problematic. For example, in Russia, exploitation costs are estimated at around $50 per barrel, uh, and some estimations, uh, some estimates are actually quite higher. It is then very hard for exploitation to be profitable under those prices. Uh, this is obviously not just true for Russia, and many projects have just stopped in the recent years. Uh, the well-known Stockman field, for example, stopped uh, all of operation in 2019, and in Alaska, we had uh, 694 active leases uh, into uh, 2008, and only eight were left uh, in 2020, indicated that profitability is an important issue, obviously, in the sector in the Arctic. Uh, a second element that I think would be interesting to consider in this economic equation for uh, development uh, of the resource sector in the Arctic, and especially oil and gas, is that many investment banks have announced that they will no longer agree to finance Arctic hydrocarbon exploration or production projects. Uh, several international financial institutions uh, have suspended the financing of oil projects at sea or throughout the Arctic. Uh, and so by the 8th of December of this year, 27 international banks uh, were listed by BankTrack as having withdrawn some funding oil projects in the Arctic. Um, it's interesting then to understand that, yes, it's costly to exploit resources in the Arctic, but it's also getting harder and harder to get backed up by a financial institution to develop projects there. And then if this goes on, this is bound to have an impact on the sector as well. And this is also something to follow in the, in the coming years. Um, in some countries, then the situation is getting complex, especially in Russia, which is going to be the, our last point of focus, uh, as Arctic resources were set up there as a major political imperative. Uh, so uh, yes, this year, new fields were discovered and new plans for exploitation were uh, set up. Um, and Arctic oil and gas are increasingly important in the total production of the country. Exploitation is also very important for the development of the Northern Sea Route, uh, which was uh, talked about by Frederick earlier, uh, and which is another political priority. So Arctic resources are quite important to support uh, the undiversified economy of the country and to fight the necessary tax revenues for the federal budgets, because the royalties on hydrocarbons represent nearly 50% of tax revenue. Uh, however, the high costs of Arctic exploitation, depressed oil prices due to the pandemic, the Chinese economic slowdown, and demand squeezed by energy transition policies, combined with the price war wage with OPEC, are contributing to make the exploitation of these resources unattractive for investors. And then uh, this situation forces Moscow to agree to subsidies or tax guests to make Arctic projects more attractive and financially sustainable, which leaves the problem of federal budget uh, balance and resolve. And this is go also going to be something to follow for the coming years. Um, so to finish, we can, we can say that we have a mixed resource assessment for 2020. Some discoveries are indeed rather promising in Alaska or Russia, for example, but the development and operation of these projects remains uncertain. 
first because operating costs are high and second because the region is well integrated into the world economy and therefore very dependent on world prices. Uh, the high volatility that has marked this year between the pandemic and the price war has therefore had a definite impact on current projects and it remains to be seen what the impact would be in the long term. And on a concluding note, I would like to note that uh, 2021 will start very early on the resource front as the Trump administration announced uh, last week plans to sell Arctic refuge oil leases in early January. And this is going to be interesting trends to follow. And with that, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for this presentation, which really kind of as to what we've seen on shipping, connecting the dots uh, with the first, with the first presentation, the first, the first team that we talked about. Uh, I want to remind uh, attendees: if you have questions, you can uh, type them at the bottom of the screen by clicking on Q and A, and then typing your question, and then we can uh, redirect it to uh, panelists. Um, could also be that panelists have questions for fellow panelists, and, and then we could also uh, either type it in the chat or the Q and A, or uh, in order for direct your question to panelists. Um, we have a few. Uh, we have a good fifteen minutes for for question and answer. Uh, as chair, I'll, I'll give myself the right of first question. It's one of the privilege of chairing uh, panels. Um, uh, first, a question to uh, I'll. I'll List all my questions to Frederick and, and Pauline. Um, often, when I, I look at and I read about um, Russian uh, Russian rhetoric about resources and shipping, there's always seemed to be a discrepancy between uh, Russian ambitions or Russian aspirations and reality. Um, I want want to hear you both about a bit your take about uh, what type. Did we see this year huge disappointment or huge discrepancy, huge difference between aspirations and reality, or did most of the plans or objectives kind of pan out? Um, question also for uh, I'll, I'll list all my questions for Adams and uh, Adam and and, and uh, Thomas. Um, you talked about the OSCE um, and, and raised the OSCE as a solution. Um, and see Thomas kind of react to the uh, The USC may be getting involved, or, or you know, we can learn some lessons from the confidence building and mechanism that they had in, uh, in place. What, what, in your mind, would be the most important obstacle to um, maybe borrowing some lessons from the USC about a confidence building and, and you know, prevention of conflict and the like? Uh, Lastly, to Dr. Thiebaud, uh, you talked about four elements of NORAD modernization. Um, which, in your mind, would be the hardest to implement? Because uh, the four are, are a pretty ambitious list of <laughs> changes to put in place. Uh, you know, it could be for Dr. Thiebaud or, or, or Dr. Lackenbar or Dr. Or, or, or um, what would be the hardest element to, to put in place? Um, in your mind. So maybe you can start with, with Frederick and, and, uh, and or uh, Pauline. Um, okay, it's been which order. <laughs> um, Pauline, est-ce que tu veux parler ou je commence? Uh, oui, tu peux y aller. <laughs> <laughs> um, in a nutshell, first, uh, regarding shipping, um, I'd say that uh, the Russian government uh, is facing significant disappointment to the extent that it really banked on the development of uh, our uh, shipping along the Northern Sea Route for revenue generation, for uh, the creation of a political leverage with the, the possible development of significant uh, transit shipping along the Northern Sea Route. And, uh, things didn't happen as planned because transit traffic obviously remains very small, at least for now. Uh, we know, we don't know what's going to happen to take place in the, in the next few years. But as far as we are, what we understand from the strategy of the shipping companies, uh, transit shipping is unlikely to, to take off significantly, uh, at least in the next few years. Um, 
still, um, destinational traffic is indeed taking off uh, along the Northern Sea Route, uh, partly because the Kremlin forces the companies to do so, to, to send, uh, to, to ship their production uh, uh, along the Northern Sea Route rather than uh, with tubes that could be more affordable for them. So this is why we see Novatec, Gazprom, uh, and other oil and gas companies uh, trying to develop also sh shipping along the London Sea Route, whereas it wouldn't be necessarily their first choice. But uh, President Putin told them, I need to increase the statistics of traffic along the London Sea Route, so you've got to send your oil and gas uh, uh, along the London Sea Route. Um, that may be useful for him to claim that the Northern Sea Route is becoming a significant artery uh, along for international trade. But uh, in maritime circles, everybody knows that this is because of Russian policies first, and that this is this destinational traffic uh, uh, in the first place. So it won't lure uh, any more shipping companies to use the Northern Sea Route because Russia is claiming a, a significant traffic because it's destinational traffic and it's also larger fuel be because of uh, partly because of Russian policies uh, forcing uh, uh, extraction companies to use the, the Northern Sea Route. Um, as far as extraction is concerned, uh, there are significant discrepancies in the Arctic too. Uh, we see, for instance, extraction remaining uh, small, minimal in Greenland, uh, in uh, North American Arctic. Uh, developing a little bit more uh, in Scandinavia because the infrastructure is more uh, developed. Uh, we see extraction being developed significantly in the Ru Russian Arctic because uh, some fields are, are very good quality first and second precisely because the Russian authorities are subsidizing and pushing uh, extraction companies to develop these resources because of political and economic objectives. Pauline, tu voulais ajouter quelque chose <laughs> C'était court. Uh, maybe Adam and Thomas. If, uh... Sure. Yeah, I'm. I'm happy to dive in. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's. It's a cracking question. And the first one, I, I will sidestep quietly about whether the OSC should be the the body responsible. Um, I, I'm. I'm not fully sure about that one, frankly. Um, but I think that the principles are perhaps where we can go to. Uh, in terms of obstacles, they are numerous and high, um, but that shouldn't stop us. It's never stopped us in the past. Why should it start stopping us now? So I think there are two primary problems that that I see. Um, the first is inherent in the regime in in Europe, um, and that's the the connection that it draws between confidence and security. You know, they put that in in the Stockholm. Uh, accords in, in, in 86 and it became went from confidence building measures to confidence and security building measures and once you do that um, it ties together being confident in the benign intent of an, a potential opponent um, with being able to defeat them militarily uh, and those two are not uh, they should not be be connected in, in my opinion so that's going to be the first challenge um, that needs to be um, really brought in there, but he said, but essentially, it's back to that question. We, we kind of know how to signal non-benign intent. How do you signal benign intent? That's that's the, the, the million dollar question. Um, but the, the, a more practical point in the Arctic at the moment, one of the reasons, one of the things that makes it challenging exactly as it was in 75 in Europe um, prior to Helsinki, um, the, there is a huge amount of existing suspicion uh, at the moment. Um, and that I think is gonna make negotiation challenging. I suspect what we would see if we just went into it tomorrow and said, we're gonna create these, is um, both sides sitting down and basically competing and really negotiating about what we want to let the other people see and what's the trade-off if we let them see this bit of behavior or this bit of infrastructure, what can we um, show them in return? And, and, and you basically create a competition in which the set of confidence building measures kind of works for neither party. Uh, so I think that that would be a real a real challenge for that, that negotiation um, and, and implementing those things. Um, but I think there are a, a, a few bits of low hanging fruit that are, uh, are knocking around there. The first I think is probably about the aircraft maneuver. Um, from what I understand, both sides have a pretty solid understanding of what 
um, everyone is doing in the air uh, around the Arctic. So, and it wasn't all that long ago when there was a greater degree of communication about what air operations were occurring. So, for example, if the Russians are going to do their long range bomber patrols, like they have been doing for a little while. There is nothing stopping Russia um, communicating that they are about to do that or that they, they have one planned. Um, there should be no reason why they would hesitate to do that. And similarly, the US, Canada can acknowledge that and tell them where they anticipate an interception occurring. Like you can start with certain bits and pieces. That's an you know, example needs to be perhaps thought through a little bit more carefully. But uh, in, in essence, there are some things that we are seeing happening that people know about. And if we can start to put that on the books as something that that uh, um, we can acknowledge is occurring, then I think that would be a really, really good start. Similarly, you know, NATO announces a, a lot of its exercises. Um, like, let's just make sure that all exercises in the Arctic are really being announced and that we're reaching out to Russia and saying, look, I've got an exercise happening. There you go. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's happening to an extent now, but by formalizing that and creating that regime around that, um, there's a possibility that we can just start to have a little bit more dialogue. So I, I hope that answers that question. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Matthew, if you don't mind, I'll dive in first on behalf of our team here in terms of a great question about the hardest element to put in place. I'm going to take that through a Canadian lens. And my approach is that securing Canadian funding in the near term to support the offensive or blurred offensive defensive defeat mechanism part of NORAD modernization relating to threats through the Arctic. So part of that bigger shield construct that these are not threats targeting the Arctic as the, the object of security, but instead it's North America as a whole are gonna be a tough sell. Adam and Nancy have both referred to the logic of why I'm suggesting this will be tough. Uh, I think we'll find that there will be money available, including some of the, the COVID-19 boost package for dual use investments that overlap with NORAD um, needs, and that can be tied to sovereignty purposes, especially if these can be tied to commitments for transformative transportation infrastructure investments and in telecommunications. I think that's readily um, conducive to, to securing some funding, but the deterrence by denial part of this overall larger layered ecosystem for defense that's being talked about, the whole shoot the archer sort of approach, I think is gonna be a, a pretty tough sell in certain sectors of Canadian society, not to mention within the NDP and some sectors of the Liberal Party in their minority government arrangement. So I think short term, that's gonna be a, a, a tough nut to crack. And if the government is serious about doing it, it's going to have to expend some political will and actually educating the public on how the, the global threat environment has changed and therefore by extension, how the North American threat environment has changed. Thank you. Uh, Nancy, Troy, do you want to add something to, uh, to this? No, I think you covered it well. In fact, I'd like Nancy to jump in if possible on this one. This is something she's been studying far more than that. All right. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm totally in agreement with Whitney. Um, and I, we've, we've discussed this at length. Um, and I mean, the little bit I want to add to that is what Canada might perceive as its its role in kind of the evolving uh, defense concept for North American defense. Um, and so uh, I like how he, he discussed, um, you know, this, this funding package um, that kind of encompasses all the needs for infrastructure and communications and things like that, that would serve both local and broader purposes, because that's a big part of the shield concept is using kind of old, current and new capabilities all integrated together to take advantage of those, those systems. Um, because it's, it's much too costly and cumbersome to try to come in with this whole new thing. So it's a matter of just um, using what we have and, and, and adding new tech to that. Um, so what that requires in Canada, of course, is a revisit 
um, to our defense and deterrence policy, as we've kind of emphasized throughout this discussion, um, and what would be politically palatable. Um, but we can already see the industries uh, chomping at the bit to be a part of the innovative solutions uh, with our American partners in exploring options to um, move forward on uh, this, this shield concept um, and how Canada might contribute, like might be very, like I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, more of a, a made in Canada values Kind of approach that might incrementally expand over time, but you know, enhanced sensors, participating in the data fusion component of uh, JADC2, and, and what does that look like? Or exploring its role if it's on, on the offensive side in a non kinetic way, like using cyber. Um, so there are multiple options to explore, but of course, they have to be done kind of within the political context. And like Whitney said, educating uh, the Canadian public about um, the changing nature of the security environment and what Canada needs to do to step up um, as part of that uh, and as part of its alliances. So I hope that that uh, addresses that. And maybe Troy, if you want, would you like to talk about the American perspective on this? I, I think he's good. We're, we're good if you have any other questions or Okay, yeah, I think the bandwidth was uh, <laughs> uh, slower. Uh, we came to the end, though, of the first panel. If you, uh, for attendees, if you have other questions, you could still type in in the chat and we communicate them to uh, panelists as well. Uh, we'll take a 10 minute break. Uh, I would like to thank you all panelists on this first panel for a great presentation and great contribution and answers, uh, really illuminating on, 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 these, uh, on these facets. So thank you to all of you. Um, uh, it concludes also the English part of, of the of the conference. The second panel will be in French. Donc nous allons prendre une pause de 10 minutes. On va commencer à 2h40. Heure d'Ottawa. Heure de l'Est. Donc 10 minutes de pause et puis on continue sur le deuxième panel par les diplomatie arctique, connectivité arctique et sécurité humaine aussi en Arctique. Donc 10 minutes de pause et on commence sur le.